Hello everyone and welcome to the latest AutoVista 24 webinar looking at the impact of the Ukraine conflict on Europe's automotive industry. I'm Phil Curry, I'm the editor of AutoVista 24 and if you move on to our next slide I'll just give you a very brief, a very brief overview of what AutoVista 24 is all about. I'm sure our regular attendees in these webinars know too much already. AutoVista 24 is your essential automotive multimedia platform, an information hub if you like. We don't just report on the news, we bring you detailed analysis of the topics that are facing the automotive industry at present. We do that through analysis, through features, through interviews, through podcasts, through video. It really is a multimedia hub and a fantastic place to find out what's going on in the industry. So do make sure that you visit autovista24.com to keep up to date. And just to uh, add a little uh, a bonus there, we also offer a free daily email which brings all of our content direct to your email inbox every morning. So you can sign up on the website and that link again, also vista24.com. Now, I could speak about this all day. I'm not going to. I'm going to let our speakers do some talking as well. And I'll just introduce them now. We are joined today by Dr. Christoph Engelskirchen, who is Chief Economist at AutoVista Group, Neil King, who is Senior Data Journalist at AutoVista24, and Zolt Horvath, who is Regional Head of Valuations in Eastern Europe. Thank you all very much for joining me. And we have a good agenda for you today as well. We are going to be looking at the scenarios and economic impact of the Ukraine conflict, how the big European markets are coping, and the disruption in Eastern Europe as well. We'll then have a summary and then a Q&A section. Now, the Q&A, you'll see a box on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, so please do feel free to ask questions throughout the webinar. We will attempt to answer as many as possible. We've got some time set aside at the end to do so. But if we don't answer your question, we will make sure that we follow up with you after this presentation is over. So this is really your chance to, to grill our experts on anything that you need to know. So please do make use of the time available at the end. We'll also have the contact details of our experts on the screen afterwards. And don't worry about taking notes because this session is being recorded and it together with the slide deck, will be made available to all attendees after we have finished. So no need to concentrate on your notebook, you can keep full focus on what we're talking about today. Now, just a very brief overview of some of the stuff that we have seen coming through and that we have reported on on AutoVista 24. If we move to our next slide, please. We have seen a number of car makers suspending joint ventures in Russia, mainly due to the sanctions imposed on the country due to their invasion of Ukraine. Supply chain issues have already bitten with some car makers pausing production lines due to a shortage of parts. And cost of materials essential to vehicle production are also rising as supplies out of Russia are halted. So there is disruption already going on for the automotive industry. But before we get into it, I would just like to ask you a quick question. We have a bit of a survey about to run here. So if we can move to our next slide and if we can start the survey. I want to know, will the rising cost of oil and gas speed up transition from internal combustion engines to EVs on new car markets? I'll give you just a, a little minute or two to, uh, to consider that. Quite simple really, is it yes, no, or is it currently unclear? We are seeing increased numbers of, or increasing levels of uh, fuel prices uh, in many different regions um, across Europe. And obviously energy prices are also rising as well. So does that negate the effect of EVs or will the increase in price of fuel and in particular diesel, which the market is collapsing there, push more drivers to consider an electric vehicle as perhaps a cheaper option for them? We'll just leave that running for just a, a moment longer. It's an interesting question. I believe uh, we'll be talking about that a little bit later on as well. With five more seconds and if we can end it there please. I can see the results here that 52% of you have said yes we will see a transition, a quick transition from internal combustion engine through to um, EV. 19% uh, saying no ice will still rain uh, and 29% pointing out that it's currently unclear. It's a very interesting result actually, um, so we'll probably look at that a little bit later on. But first now we'll move on to our first speaker, um, which is uh, Christoph, we'll come to you. 
uh, if we could move to our next slide, and we will look at the scenarios and economic impact of the Ukraine conflict. Now, Christoph, what are the current scenarios uh, around the conflict that we're, we're working with at the moment? Yes, I'm, I'm, I mean, thank you, first of all, for being able to, to attend today and being invited for this um, webinar. So when it comes to the Ukraine war, we um, are all following the situation closely, I'm sure, um, and, and so are you. Um, so we, what we do know is that it is very unclear how the, yeah, the conflict and the war will, will resolve. And there is no win-win possible in this conflict and um, yeah and and people and, and and so do we have to work with scenarios and when you see a couple of the the, the forecasts and I'm, I'm sure you follow that also quite um, closely a lot of forecasts are based on um, what we call the base case scenario which is amongst the you know the negative scenarios that are an outcome of this war still the most positive one that scenario is, is down there on the slide um, in bold print. So, so basically, the, the, the hope that many forecasters have, many institutes are, are having at the moment, is that the war can be contained and that we will see you know, something like the Cold War 2.0, um, because we've seen it before, um, the Iron Curtain Falls, that would definitely, of course, be... Um, um, a, a negative outcome, but it's still the best one that is currently possible. And that would at least bring stability back to the relations that we are seeing um, yeah, that are currently very unstable. Yeah, and um, let's, let's hope for the best. There are other scenarios here, also shown in the slide. But today, we will be focusing in our forecast on that base case scenario. Now, what will the economic impact be? I've known, uh, I've heard a lot of people talking about stagflation, uh, which is a new word to me. Um, so what does that mean as well? Yeah, moving on to the next slide, um, you're absolutely right. The, the, the base case assumption from forecasters um, and also from, from us and that you know, we are feeding into our teams is a stagflation scenario across um, most economies of the world. And the good news is that Apparently, there is a term yeah, for what we're currently seeing, um, so that means that we've seen it before, and we, you know, could expect that um, central banks, because they are a central actor in this in this uh, topic, will know how to react. So, what is stagflation? Stagflation means that we will have subdued economic growth for quite some time, and the inflation stays at the high level that we're currently seeing, and the the, the um, and, and here on that slide, you'll see a, a couple of sub-bullets, um, which um, I let you read um, yourselves. I mean, basically, if, if everything gets more expensive, and that is the negative spiral that we are seeing in a stagflation scenario, possibly, people want to earn more money. Um, they will get more money, and the companies, in order to you know, to react to the rising costs of salaries, but also of, of, of raw materials, of energy, they react by increasing prices. And, and that's, the, that's the spiraling effect that we will see here. If the central banks do not react to that scenario, it means that high inflation becomes the new norm, which um, is, um, is very problematic. And therefore, we do expect that the central banks do react um, differently than previously estimated and, and anticipated, but they will react by increasing interest rates and they have they have done so. And we will also see this um, from the European Central Banks over the coming months. So it's, it's, it's always better to react to high inflation than to, you know, to not react to high inflation. That is also um, yeah, a learning from, you know, past crises. So interest rates will rise, but not in the same way as people might have thought um, end of last year, when inflation actually started. Yeah, and I think we have a slide on, on inflation as well, if you could move on to the next one. Uh, so the, the, the inflation situation or the inflationary situation that we're in at the moment isn't 
hasn't started with uh, the U Ukraine invasion or the Russian invasion into the Ukraine. It has actually already started um, during the last um, half of 2021. Yeah? And energy and food, they account for on average around two thirds of that inflation effect that we are seeing building up here. And the you know the 7.5 for March and also also the 6.2 for February on the very right side of this chart, that is a reflection of the rising um, energy prices and food prices as well. Um, but that is more triggered by um, you know markets reacting to the to the war in the Ukraine. Yeah, maybe one further comment on inflation. I mean. There is a base effect here. So we are always comparing in these monthly inflation rates, um, March 22, for example, with March 21. And if you compare, you know, to the March of last year, where prices were, were very low, it's obvious that the inflation compared to March 21 is high. So the yearly or the annual inflation that we will see in the Eurozone is not going to be 7% or 7.5% in that base scenario so it'll it'll because you know in, in the end um, we're always comparing still a lot with with months where inflation was quite low um you know beginning of um, 2021 yeah but inflation will definitely be above target zone in 2022 target zone is something around two percent with a corridor around it so what's um what's impact is this having uh say particularly on new car prices yes absolutely so we will talk about used car prices as well but also about new car prices and if you move to the next slide you can see how new car prices have also been rising over the past two years so you, you see four countries on the slide and three lines so the the middle line the orange line is the average um of, of all uh, codes and, and cars and variants of cars that we're recording in our systems. The um, top line is um, the line for the more expensive powertrain variants and, 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 and trim combinations. So first of all, if you look, for example, at Spain, uh, over the past two years, 16% increase in new car prices on average, but towards the um, you know higher priced cars, you, you see, especially towards um, the end of each of these lines, you see um, a swifter rise. Yeah? So OEMs, they are reacting to two years of undersupply by upping the prices um, and also by optimizing the margins, as it seems, for example, by increasing the prices for the more expensive variants um, even further yeah, than for um, the, let's say, the, the rest of the, the, the variations that they offer on the market. So that's what we are currently seeing. And this is not going to go away, right? So this is something we'll have to all keep in mind when we talk about um, also residual value outlooks. We have a market where list prices are rising and will continue to rise over the next months, at least. Now, just to uh, come back a little bit to our, um, our survey question there, Christoph, um, could we see more people turn to EVs as a result of the oil price rise? Yeah, I mean, I, I love the question because it was a very simple yes-no question. I remember 52% of, of people said yes, 19% said no. Um, I think that, that is a pretty fair reflection of what we anticipate could happen, right? So first of all, there are trends that are supporting a faster transition to electric vehicles over what we've just discussed. So first of all, there is an ambition of markets and of customers to reduce the dependency um, from, from oil. And you know what better way is there to move into electric vehicles if you want to, for whatever psychological or cost reason, to um, avoid oil in your portfolio, personal portfolio, company portfolio. So that's that's the positive. Another positive could be the total cost of ownership position of battery electric vehicles, in particular in those markets that are not as dependent on on gas imports, right? So those markets, um, for example, France, they rely on um, other sources for their energy. That's why 
you know, electricity might not rise as much as, as fuel costs, which is a positive. And also, when we think about plug-in hybrids, we might see a positive development for plug-in hybrids as used cars, because it's, a, it's kind of like the best from both worlds, right? You can drive with electricity and you have the flexibility for long drives. So for those people that are quite concerned about thefts and theft remarketing, it could help thefts to you know, remain um, or become a little bit more attractive on also on used car markets. Um, the caveats, I want to mention two caveats here, and probably people answering no see those as well. List prices are also rising for battery electric vehicles and, and plug-in hybrid electric vehicles. Um, so they're not per se getting more attractive. They're also getting more expensive and they're already very expensive. And you know, customers might delay purchase decisions and, and purchasing cars. So in, in a market where we have an undersupply, yeah, where demand is not met, if you keep on rising prices, at some point demand will also come down which um, yeah might um, create a different um, scenario on yeah on, on on used car markets for example. Christoph, thank you very much. Uh, if we have any questions for Christoph, please don't forget the Q and A at the end, uh, and make use of that uh, that box on the side. Uh, we'll now move on to uh, our next agenda point, which is uh, how the big European uh, markets are coping. Uh, Neil. Um, first to come to you, what direct impacts have we already seen from the war in Ukraine? Yeah, hi Phil, good afternoon everybody. Um, yeah, I mean the first impact we really saw, which was widely reported, was a shortage of wiring harnesses um, sourcing, sourced from the afflicted region and um, the, the main impact initially uh, affected German manufacturers, so we saw the likes of BMW and Volkswagen Group both adjusting their production um, but this, this isn't only in Germany, so for, in the case of BMW, it's not just the Dingolfing plant, but it also Mini was affected in Oxford in the UK. Similarly, across the Volkswagen Group, uh, Skoda was hit in their plant in Malada Boleslav in the Czech Republic. Um, and speaking to Mercedes directly, they confirmed to me that they've also adjusted their shift plans. So, um, you know, initially it looks like Germany has been quite hard hit in terms of the industry, but not exclusively. Um, uh, the second sort of major critical factor that really came to light was the disruption to neon gas supply. Now, unbeknown to myself prior to uh, recent events, neon gas is, uh, uh, let's say, a key ingredient in the production of semiconductors. It's, in, it's part of the uh, lith lithography process in that uh, production of semiconductors. And understandably, you know, this is obviously compounding the, the pre-existing semiconductor shortages that the industry has been contending with certainly since about the second half of last year. Um, and on that note, I mean, Ford themselves um, have widely reported that they've been affected by the chip shortage. The news has come to light this week that they're looking at essentially bringing forward their Easter shutdown and you know, as a case in point, you know, um, fundamentally, we may not see much sort of Fiesta production pretty much again until uh, the end of the month. So, and bear in mind, the Fiesta obviously is one of your best selling models. So, just to really drive home, um, you know, the, the magnitude of this, of the, of the impact. Um, and similarly, you know, Volvo Cars is also affected in Sweden. Now, again, they confirmed to me directly that they, they have very limited sort of direct relationships with suppliers in the region, but nevertheless, because of a cascading effect, um, they themselves are also adjusting production. So this is quite a widespread issue, and I suspect there, there's more disruption occurring than even we're aware of. Um, and this will inevitably rumble on for the, for the short term, if not longer term, and something we can discuss later. But um, you know, on the flip side, um, there are a couple, of potentials win a couple of potential winners out of this entire scenario. First of all, um, Asian car manufacturers seem to be largely un unaffected. So, you know, the likes of obviously Toyota, Nissan in Japan, Hyundai, Kia in, in Korea, and even Chinese manufacturers um, don't seem to sort of be suffering in the same way. And you can see that in, in two areas. One, in terms of registration volumes, Hyundai, Kia are doing exceptionally well. They're growing their market share in Europe. Their year-on-year -year growth rates are significantly higher than most competitors. 
Um, and, and, you know, beyond that, secondly, you know, we also have this issue uh, as far as nickel is concerned, whereby, um, you know, obviously Russia is a primary source for nickel. Um, in the case of China, they are still sourcing nickel from, from Russia, so they're less affected by you know, the impact on prices that we've seen of all sorts of uh, com uh, commodities, raw materials, not just nickel, but also palladium, aluminium, etc., because of the uh, the, Russia, the, the war in Ukraine. Um, and on that note, you know, because Chinese manufacturers are able to source that nickel from Russia, they're less affected, especially when it comes to battery electric vehicles. Um, and this plays into their hands, really. You know, they're less likely to have to raise prices. And of course, this is at a time when, you know, various Chinese manufacturers, as we widely report ourselves, are looking to enter the European market. Indeed, I know uh, altavista24.com, I'm going to put a plug in there, uh, altavista24.com journalist uh, Rebecca Shade put uh, put together a nice piece on um, on nickel prices and the, the advantages for Chinese manufacturers. So uh, I recommend you all check that out on, again, altavista24.com uh, and just uh, do a search for nickel or search the, the region section on the website. Um, Neil, coming back to you, um, when it comes to the big five European markets, the big five, I include the UK in that as we're talking about the continent, not just the union. Um, what impact is the, the Ukraine conflict having on them? Um, well, if we could move on to the next slide. Um, I've sort of presented here the view that I've adopted for Germany and I, I've pretty much adopted the same sort of development profile across all the major markets. But, you know, as, as many viewers may have already seen, um, there were dramatic declines in new car registrations in all the big five markets um, uh, in March. Um, essentially double digit declines ranging from, it was about 15% in the UK to right up to 30% in Spain and Italy, although there were extra mitigating circumstances there. But nevertheless, um, I mean, that, that impact, uh, you know, I have to be honest, was far more dramatic than I expected, certainly for March, given that Obviously, Russia, uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine didn't really start until really late in February. Um, but as it stands, uh, understandably, the, the current disruption that we're seeing in production is reflected in the, the outlook, the assumption for new car registrations in the second quarter. Um, but even beyond that, with a, even with a displacement effect from losses that we're seeing now, um, you know, the, the recovery that was always expected and the general industry consensus that in terms of semiconductors as well, that those bottlenecks would ease in the second half of the year. Now, that recovery is now slower than anticipated. And, you know, in the case of Germany, I've just reworked the numbers furiously this week as soon as they came out. And I'm now looking at, you know, the German market uh, being about 150,000 units lower this year than uh, was predicted before the uh, before the Russian invasion. Um, as I say, that equates to about five percent drop, so quite dramatic. And just to reiterate, you know, as I say, applying the same sort of logic across all markets. So Germany is certainly not unique. So um, if these problems continue. How could European registrations pan out uh, across the rest of the year? Okay. Well, if we move on to the next slide. So, I mean, as it stands, um, I've alluded to it there already, you know, we're seeing obviously a short term impact within 2022, much lower recovery than previously anticipated, largely because of the, uh, the compounding challenges in terms of sourcing semiconductors. But, but the net effect of a whole year now, this was the forecast that I issued last month. I, I, you know, immediately reduced the European registrations outlook by about half a million units so about four percent compared to, uh, to to where we were but given the latest numbers were trickling through already and that more dramatic impact than expected in March I can envisage certainly reducing at least another 200,000 units from that so we could well see um, Europe being sort of five to six percent lower this year than anticipated uh, prior to uh, events at the end of February um, now, obviously, there you know, is an, an element of displacement into next year. Uh, I generally work on the assumption that not everything will be recovered, but let's assume, say, about two-thirds are recovered into next year. Obviously, 
um, the, the magnitude of that depends really on the losses this year. But um, nevertheless, you know, if we get to a let's say a stabilizing effect come 2024, 2025, and hopefully we, the world can return to a semblance of normality after uh, let's say two incredibly disruptive years, um, even in 2025, we, we're still seeing the, the European new car market being about 23% below the level that it achieved uh, in a pre-pandemic, obviously back in 2019. And lastly, what will be the impact on residual values of used cars and how have forecasts in the bigger markets changed versus previous months? Yeah, sure. If we can move on to the next slide. So, I mean, we've we've built this sort of impact matrix, um, which highlights fundamentally the, the positive or negative impact of the, the war in Ukraine on, on various factors. Now, as we've already discussed, obviously, we're seeing a dramatic impact on new car demand already. Um, we've discussed supply issues, so not surprising the weakness there. Um, rising prices. Um, now, ordinarily, you know, this obviously, as we've seen throughout the COVID-19 pandemic as well, would actually then uh, divert a certain number of consumers into used cars. So we would expect to see higher used car demand and typically um, high residual values. Um, but I must caution that there are two critical compensating factors within this. One, obviously, we have higher living costs, which not will not only affect demand for the new cars, but also for used, including higher financing because of rising interest rates, for example. Um, and secondly, of course, as we've widely covered, uh, residual values are at record levels uh, pretty much across the region. Um, and so the, the net effect is that actually we're, we're seeing very, very limited impact on residual values as it stands. Um, and, you know, bear in mind, we've already seen, uh, certainly in March, that some most used car markets are stabilizing. Activity is less, it's more subdued than it was. Um, not the sort of nominal growth that we have seen over the last couple of years. Um, and, you know, there's one example. I mean, in the UK, residual values at the end of last year were about 40% higher than the year before. Um, and in conjunction with that subdued market activity that we've certainly seen in the UK, we're actually expecting our residual values to be lower this year. Although, obviously, there is, a, let's say, a, a, a positive contribution from from the, the events in the Ukraine. Um, and I just wanted to sort of flag one extra point. I'm sure, you know, everybody is familiar with uh, Putin's Putin's demands as far as uh, seeking rubles as payment for the gas, for example. Um, now, that is not factored in this scenario. That essentially would take us into another scenario, but obviously there are, there are countless risks and let's say opportunities for escalation and, uh, you know, different impact accordingly. But that's, that's fundamentally where we stand, that uh, no major impact on residual values. And, and on that note, if we could just move on to the next slide. Um, now, many of our viewers hopefully are familiar with this already, but I just wanted to highlight that we we do publish a monthly market update each month covering the big five European markets and Austria and Switzerland. And within that, we track the latest residual value developments, used car activity, um, used car supply, and also obviously stock days. Uh, this is all split by fuel type um, and crucially, also presents our latest residual value outlook. Um, and just on that note, I mean, just this month, we have actually increased the residual value outlook for Germany, Spain, and Italy, for example, um, although a bit of a downturn in the UK. Um, so yeah, I just encourage people to uh, have a look at that update, which we do publish every month. And within it, we, we embed this, uh, this glorious Tableau dashboard, if you haven't already seen it. And you can find that on autovista24.com. Uh, just go to the used car section uh, and it is in there. It is, it is monthly. So it's not what we plan to put that in, really. Um, Neil, thank you very, very much. Uh, I, I do recommend, by the way, reading the, the monthly market update. It's, it, it really does give a, a great overview of what's going on in the industry. Um, Nazol, we'll come to you. Um, now, of course, Eastern Europe is feeling the brunt of uh, what's going on. Uh, in the conflict at present. Um, 
What kind of impacts were facing these markets at the beginning of the war? Thank you, Phil. Uh, good, good afternoon to everybody. Uh, before the war, it seemed that the Central East European markets were going back on the recovery path, but the war presented these markets as well with another new challenges. First impact to Poland, Czechia and Hungary was on the exchange rate of the local currencies. It was around 8-10 percentage drop down at the beginning of the war then the local national banks needed to do interventions to protect the currencies. The base interest rates have been increased. So after one month from the beginning of the conflict, the currencies, uh, the exchange rate are stabilized and returned to really the pre-war levels. This effect did not occur in Romania and obviously in Slovakia. Although Romania is uh, also outside the Eurozone with the Romanian lay, but the national bank seems very determined to maintain the Euro exchange rate close to 4.95. So there was no such up and down fluctuation as in Czechia, Hungary or Poland. But the interventions of national banks uh, in the three markets has negative effect on inflation as well as the car financing rates. So, um, if inflation is a major consequence, similar to rising energy prices, how did this appear in the region? Um, let's uh, let's see the inflation. Please move on to the next slide, please. Uh, the inflation increased everywhere. Uh, Christoph didn't mention the, the present day markets, the Central European markets. So, as it can be seen, unfortunately, the Central East European countries are more affected. The amount currently is around 8-11 percentage. In Czechia is the highest that strongly increase the living cost. But uh, Hungary is interesting in this respect. The energy prices, including gas and electricity, have been fixed for several years now by the authorities. Also the fuel prices since November 2021 and some important goods uh, since February. So in this term, in Hungary, the 8.5 inflation is extremely high. Regarding the energy prices, the energy price, uh, including fuel prices, increased dramatically everywhere, except uh, Hungary, as I mentioned, where the normal type of fuels, the petrol 95 and the diesel are fixed. Uh, a similar authority action was introduced in Slovenia a few weeks ago. Uh, the effect of energy price increase in Central East European markets much higher on a consumer consumption than in Western Europe. So it could have a negative impact on uh, demand of car purchasing. And the, the starting point of the used car values is, is the new price, as we all know that. So what's the trend currently uh, in, in your region? Okay, if we, if we look at the new cars, uh, please move on to the next slide. Yeah, okay, thank you. The, the demand slightly decreased in some markets, but still higher than the supply. Our region was optimistic at the beginning of the year. After the supply chain issue, it seemed that the new car production was uh, recovering. Unfortunately, the war has destroyed these expectations. So the demand is still higher than the supply almost everywhere, and it seems uh, the new supply issues due to the war in Ukraine will not remedy this in, in the short term. Poland is slightly different, where the high energy prices and additionally the new labor tax shame introduction strongly affected on the demand of car purchasing, I mean both the new and the used car as well. If you see the, the new price development, that is very interesting that uh, there's none other effect uh, that the chart shows that uh, the new price development in the last four years in these markets. The basic month is January 2018. At the beginning, I mean during 2018, the chart shows horizontally flat curve as the new prices were stable at that time. Then according to the CAFE rule introduction, the prices have been rising steadily for three years now, currently approximately 16 percentage higher than in 2019. In case of Hungary, the change is even bigger. Uh, the reason is the continuing weakening of the local currency. The change uh, is 30 percentage in Hungary. That is huge effect on the one, two, one, uh, three year old uh, used car prices as well. In March, uh, the prices have not changed significantly. The importers uh, had a couple of hard days 
when the exchange rates went down at the beginning of the war. The question right now is the rising raw material and energy prices, how these cost increasing impacts on the production cost then indirectly appear in the new prices as well. And how are residual values being affected by what's going on? Yeah, um, so please move on to the next slide. Uh, so uh, as we look at the basic parameters by market, they show similar patterns, just in case of Poland and Hungary have some differences. Uh, the economic side that uh, the high uh, cost of living, such as inflation and energy price, reduce the demand on car purchasing. So generally these effects have negative impact on uh, used car values. Regarding fuel price increase, it has restructured the demand on used cars. The low consumption cars are preferred by the buyers, like in Czechia, where almost all of the 1.6 TDI Škoda Octavia disappeared from the used car market. And finally, the cost increase of car financing has also a negative impact on the used car demand. If you see the new car, new car demand in overall no significant changes, no additional impact on the residual values except Poland, as I mentioned, due to the high living cost that reduced the demand on cars. The new car supply reduced like uh, in everywhere in Europe, so it would increase the residual values. The new car prices, the exchange rates of the local currencies return to the pre-war level, so this has no further price increasing effect, but the rising raw material and energy prices could impact on the OEM's production cost. If these costs appear in the new prices as increasing effect, then obviously the used car prices will be rising as well. Demand on used cars, uh, the challenge of new car supply is uh, driving potential customers towards the used vehicles, but the high living cost has opposite effect. The used car supply, the used car stocks reduced everywhere, reduced in the Central East markets as well as in Western Europe. So Poland and Romania are the biggest used car importers from Western Europe. The lack of vehicles has a price increasing effect but directly, according to war, no significant change is, uh, is expected. So in summary, the, the used car values are already extremely high everywhere, hit the overall records. There are several effects of the Ukraine-Russia war to these markets. Some of them would increase, while the others would decrease the used car prices. The impact on residual values of the war, therefore, expected to be relatively modest, less than one percentage just limited development in these countries. The plus and minus effects can be deferred by markets, such in case of Poland downwards, or on the other side in Hungary, where uh, additional price increase is calculated due to the war effect. Prices are already much higher than a year ago. So I would never have, never have thought in my 30 years of automotive career that I ever say these words, but a car is also an investment currently. Thank you, Phil. Thank you, Zolt, and thank you to uh, Neil and Christoph as well. Uh, so now we'll just have a very quick summary of, of some of the points brought up today. Uh, if we can move to our next slide. There we, go. Uh, we can see there are three potential scenarios based on how uh, the Ukraine war will evolve. Monthly inflation is on the rise across Europe, with Central East European countries most affected. This is contributing to higher list prices for new vehicles across Europe. The EV market could benefit from rising sorry, oil prices, but this is unlikely to be disruptive. Added disruption to fragile supply chains, uh, the impact has already been felt in March's new car registrations. There's going to be a limited impact expected across big European markets as already at record levels and costs uh, are jeopardising demand. That's the RVs anyway tongue tying there. The war destroyed optimism in the automotive industry in Eastern Europe uh, following hoped recovery from supply chain issues and the RV impact will differ in different Eastern European markets but it's expected to be less than one percent overall. Now we'll move on to our Q&A. We've got a few minutes to, uh, to answer some questions here. We've had a few coming in throughout but again please do make use of the questions box on the screen on the right hand side you might have to expand the questions box, it might just be down as a, a ribbon, but uh, just look out for questions and you can put your details in there. And again, if we don't get to answer them in this session, we will follow up with you afterwards. Um, the first one, I think, will we'll come to you, Neil. 
Um, what's your best guess um, for the how long the lead time disruption will continue? Uh, how could it develop in the near future? So we're talking obviously about uh, delivery of vehicles there. Wow. Um, I, in many ways, I'd say my initial reaction is that's probably one for the Russian presidency. But um, but beyond that, um, it, it's very difficult because. You know, on the one hand, we talk about securing alternative supplies, whether that's components or raw materials, but this isn't something that can happen overnight. Now, if you're looking at safety critical components, they typically require recertification, um, you know, to obviously meet safety standards. Now, that process can take months, obviously, or more often not about six months. So that's not going to be going to be quick. But even other components, raw materials. To secure alternative supply, that involves two things. One, you, you're having to obviously increase output. Now, it could be as simple as, well, okay, moving from a, a two shift pattern to a three shift pattern to meet that surge in demand. But even to do that, that assumes one, you have all the materials coming in to produce those components. And two, you have the, the workforce in place. And more to a point, um, even if you have a large enough workforce, if you're bringing new people on board, they need to be trained. And so, you know, it's, I think it's, it's quite often a, let's say a bit of a misnomer really, whereby people assume that, oh, well, we'll just source it from, you know, country B instead of country A, but this doesn't happen overnight. So, I mean, to answer the question, fundamentally, obviously I've built in disruption, certainly over the second quarter, both in production and registrations. Um, but realistically i think we're going to be seeing an impact of some kind over most of the year um and as i always say if you bear in mind that a car has thirty thousand parts it only needs one thing to be missing and the whole industry really grinds to a halt thank you uh christoph one for you um do um are car makers able to absorb the cost of uh, higher materials uh, rather than increasing car prices to pass on to consumers is that going to impact profitability for them going forward or is it something that's inevitable that we're going to see prices rise in the uh, in the in the new car market yeah i mean it's not a it's not a likely scenario <clears throat> that the the companies will you know not hand over rising prices to you know those paying for the services or products. I mean, that's unlikely that they're going to do that. So they're not going to absorb these extra costs. Um, I think, but, but there are ways to deal with rising costs, right? You can, you can prioritize you know, certain, certain models, certain, certain features. You can prioritize models that have a higher margin. You can let the customers, um, you know, decide which options they, buy or do not buy yeah, so in the end um, customers may have to downgrade or decontent some of the um, things that are you know they, they would have usually chosen but in the end the prices will not be absorbed by, by the oems and, and maybe one, one further comment we are, we are, we are seeing a situation where um, supply shortage i'm talking 25 and more percent lower car registrations over the past two years every year um, so this year might not be too different yeah, than last year in terms of car registration so we are um, in a situation where there is an undersupply so even if demand um, is is slightly suppressed yeah, by by rising prices and the economic economic pressure um, the supply might even be more depressed Right, so it's it's it, it could balance each other out from a residual value market perspective. Um, that would mean you know stability or even slightly rising prices for used cars. Thank you. Uh, I'm aware time is is short, but I do have one more question uh, which I'd like to pose, perhaps to to Neil and to Zolt. Um, what do you think the RV impact will be if uh, electric vehicle catalog prices further increase, as we're probably already starting to see with some OEMs? Um, Zolt, do you want to comment on that first for your region? Oh, Zolt, you're on mute there, sorry. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. Oh. So, uh, uh, the electric cars in our region is, is uh, not not so um, attractive for the for the buyers because of the um, high prices. But uh, if we if we see the the um, ice uh, the combustion engines 
uh, that the first consideration of future prices is the, the new prices. Uh, so uh, as, the, as these are the starting point of the depreciation curves, um, as it was told many times that the new price uh, increase is predicted. Uh, additionally, another effect is coming only three years and the Euro 7 will be, will, will be here. So I think 2025 uh, the introduction will be. So that is very, very close. Uh, it will have also price increasing effect. Then uh, the forecast have also depend on future demand and surprise. Uh, supply, so demand is still higher, and um, as uh, as um, everybody knows that this uh, car registration issue, that um, the 2020, 21, 22 model year cars will be missing uh, in Western European markets and also the Eastern European markets. So and again, the inflation. So I think that, that all of this consideration drive us that to the conclusion that the forecast values. Uh, of the uh, of the ice uh, uh, engines will be rising definitely in Europe. Uh, the, the 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 electric cars is not so attractive in our our region. And Neil, just a quick comment from you, because I'm aware we're, we're very short on time at the moment. Um, yeah, I think I think I just echo what Joel commented there. I mean, there's two sides to this. Um, you know, obviously we're we're facing rising prices, but there's nothing to suggest necessarily that electric vehicle prices will rise quicker than petrol prices. I mean, we've talked about nickel uh, impacts, but obviously there's other materials such as palladium goes into cat catalytic converters. So, um, you know, there's a balancing effect there. Um, I mean, in terms of residual values, what I would say is very quickly that we were, let's say, certainly uh, less bullish about residual values for battery electric vehicles, largely because we've seen more coming through to the used car market than it could absorb. Um, but that is uh, changing over time, and we have just actually increased our sort of assumptions across the board, but including for battery electric vehicles and, and plug-ins as well. Um, but again, a, a lot of that, dare I say it, I'll have to take the opportunity to plug it, but a lot of that you'll actually see reflected in the uh, in the monthly market dashboard as well. Excellent, thank you, Neil. Um, I'll leave it there. We we have got some more questions coming. Uh, again, I'll, I'll reassure everybody who's who's joining us, who has asked a question, um, we will get to you um, after this presentation. We will, we will be following up with you all. So if you've asked a question, we haven't answered it, have no fear, we will be uh, responding uh, directly. Um, if we can move on to our final slide. Uh, on screen now you can see uh, the contact details for our experts, uh, Christoph, Neil, Zolt. Uh, again, thank you all very much for joining us. Um, and my details as well if you have any questions uh, concerning Autobus 24 or any of the questions that you've heard today. Um, now we do have a vast amount of data available for our Autobus group and if you would like to learn a bit more about that, then uh, one little demo of our residual value intelligence. Uh, you can contact Tim Budgin, whose details are there on screen as well. And a final reminder that this presentation has been recorded, uh, so you can listen back to it uh, at your leisure, uh, along with the slide deck. These will be presented to you uh, after this presentation has ended. Thank you, everybody, for attending. Again, thank you to the panel, and we will uh, catch up with you soon on the next AutoVista 24 webinar. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, Thanks, everybody. Goodbye. Thanks. Goodbye.